Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Rebecca Alcoholic. (laughs) 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 You nailed it. You nailed it. Thank you so much for your share. It was awesome. And, uh, and I love that. I love hearing the miracles in Alcoholics Anonymous. We are not unique. We do this deal and crazy things happen, you know? It's awesome. Um, Julie, I want to thank you so much for um, reaching out to me and asking me to speak. Um, it's actually my first time at this meeting and, uh, what a great group of people. Uh, but speaking is not my favorite thing to do. I don't particularly like you guys looking at me. Uh, it makes me a little bit awkward. Um, but it is an honor and privilege to be up here. And, um, and my dad's here with me tonight, um, which is great. He's also a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he's celebrating 40 years of continuous sobriety tomorrow. So, that's him right there. Second row. I'm so proud of him. He's awesome. I love my dad. I am really lucky to be able to share this program with him. And um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I I guess I'm just going to share my experience, my strength, and my hope. And uh, I hope that you can look for the similarities and not the differences. That's what they told me when I was new. Um, And that seemed to work for me. I thought I was terminally unique. And uh, I was a special case. And, uh, you know, and I was different and set apart from you. And that's not true. Um, And as soon as I was able to lay that aside, I heard the music of Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard and felt the magic in here. And, um, and the magic is still alive in here. You know, um, I, uh, God, still trying to catch my breath. Uh, I was born in Houston, Texas. And um, I moved away from there at a pretty young age, and we moved up to Seattle. Um, my parents actually met in a bar called the Brass Monkey, and uh, <laughs> they were both drinking, and uh, they had an alcoholic um, marriage and uh, divorced by the time I was three. And my mother in- inherited a fairly large sum of money and took me and my three brothers and moved up to Seattle, and my dad joined AA and, um, and followed uh, shortly after. And um, by the time I was eight, my mom went through all that money and, and basically just kind of said, I can't do this anymore. This mothering thing is too much for me and, um, and walked away. And, and my dad raised me and my three brothers and, uh, by himself, I uh, mind you. And he was, uh, fairly new in AA and I just, my hat is off to him cause it's, I have one and it's hard, you know, um, but he had four and we were pretty crazy. And, um, you know, as a, as a eight year old, you know, I mean, I like, I just remember feeling um, very different, very set apart as a little girl, you know, and um, and of course, since then, I've done inventory and I know my mom did the best job she could do, you know, with the tools that she was given. But um, but, you know, I just I I had that ism way before I took my first drink. You know, I I was always really obsessed with what you thought about me, you know, and um, and I remember when I took my first drink, it took that away. I didn't get prettier. I didn't get smarter or anything like that. But I just no longer cared. And I loved that feeling. And actually, you know, and it's so cliche and you hear a lot of speakers talk about it, that when I took my first drink, um, I I laughed for the first time. Like I, like everything made sense, you know, and I could feel, and I fit comfortable. Um, this world was just like, I could do, I could do this world, um, uh, with alcohol, whereas before I couldn't. And, um, and, you know, but I also had this thing, like I, I was in 4-H and I was involved with my church and I was, you know, I wanted to be and do something else. Like I had dreams of being a doctor actually when I was a kid and, you know, I had other aspirations and I didn't want to be an alcoholic and I actually kind of had some, um, uh, some knowledge about alcoholism since my dad was in AA and, you know, so I always had kind of this two way thing and, um, and, and I was fighting against that and, um. But eventually, at some point, I believe I lost the power whether to choose whether I could drink or not. And, um, and I abandoned myself to alcohol at a very young age. And um, I wasn't a daily drinker as a teenager, but I did drink as often as I possibly could. And, um, and by the time I was 14, I got kicked out of school for drinking vodka in the bathroom stall. And I went to my first treatment center. And that ruined my drinking, <laughs> which really sucked for me because I didn't get sober until I was 35. And uh, <laughs> so it was 21 years of in and out of this deal, you know. Um, and, and I remember as a teenager, I found this place called Hilltop Fellowship Hall. It's no longer there, but it's a lot like an Alano club. It was a 
the Fremont of the East Side. Uh, this place was crazy and awesome, and I loved it. And uh, and there was a lot of young people, and I fit right in. But the thing is, is I, I didn't find any kind of solution to my alcoholism. And without any kind of solution, pretty soon I have a crazy mind that's telling me that this time, this time I'll be able to control it. You know, it's that great obsession that somehow someday I will beat this game. You know, and uh, and and I really would convince myself that you know what I had some emotional problems. If I drink again, you know, maybe this time I'll control it. Or if I kind of you know twerk it a little bit this way, tweak it a little bit, not twerk, uh, <laughs> but tweak it a little bit this way, you know, then maybe I won't cross the line and, and, uh, and really believing that, you know, and, uh, and never being able to achieve that ideal. And as soon as I drink things, you know, I was right back where I started from and things would get so bad again that I have to get sober. And I spent that, um, that cycle as a teenage girl for many, many years. And, um, and by the time I was 18, I went to my second treatment center. I got out, uh, I fell in love in AA, and uh, he, uh, you know, he tattooed my name on his shoulder, and I thought we were in love, and, um, and uh, he, uh, he was my first really, you know, my first real boyfriend, my first long-term relationship, and, and, uh, um, and I had a son at 20 years old. I had a son named Elliot, and, uh, and he was beautiful, you know, and when I had this kid, I, you know, I, I had every intention of being a good mother to him, you know, I had every intention of, of raising him right. And, um, and, uh, and, and when I had about two and a half years of sobriety, um, I decided that, you know what, I just need some relief. I just need to take the edge off. And now that I'm a mother, there's absolutely no way that I will, uh, do anything to harm him or, or cross that line. And, and I will be able to control myself. And, um, and in eight days I lost everything, including, uh, uh, getting introduced to heroin and cocaine and committing my first felony. And, um, and I was raised on the East side, you know, I am not street smart. <laughs> At least I wasn't then. Uh, and, um, I was not like, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, you know, at all. And, uh, and, and I lost my kid. Um, it's a long story and I can't, I don't really have time to get into it, but basically my roommates told on me, you know, cause they knew that I was nodding off and that I was unable to take care of this, this little infant who was eight months old at the time. And, um, and the cops came and they, you know, found puncture holes in my arm and they took my son and, um, and I went and I, 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 I left, I, I, left with this boyfriend and we, we went and we, you know, to downtown Seattle and I, I hit places that I just, like I said, I was not familiar of. I had absolutely no hustle. I was in shooting galleries and crack houses and, uh, I lost a bunch of weight and, uh, you know, and I had like no idea what I was getting myself into, like I said. And, um, and basically a couple months of that, I went to my third treatment center, which was Cedronar. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Cedronar, but it's a long-term treatment center. It's behavior modification. It's work therapy, and it's um, addict, help addict or something like that. I don't know. And I went there, and I actually completed the program. I got my son back, and and when I got out, um, I was at the right place at the right time, and I landed a job at Boeing, and I had a, um, I had an apartment, and I had my kid, like I said, and uh, you know, on the outside, everything looked really good. You know, I was in my twenties, my early twenties, and. Um, you know, and I thought, this is it. This is my solution. That if everything on the outside looks good, then, then I'll be okay. And, uh, and it wasn't, you know, and those that are real alcoholics know that that's not the real solution. And, um, and so I convinced myself yet again that I will drink and I drink. And, uh, and this time, um, you know, CPS found out that I was drinking again and that I was doing other stuff. And, uh, and they took my son and they put and at, at first I tried really hard to get him back and I was unable to do that. And, um, I was unable to get sober and, uh, he had, uh, they had placed him in an adoptive foster care home. And, um, and these guys were great. You know, they were, uh, a mother, father, they provided for him. They gave him a life that I would never be able to give to him. And, uh, and what happened was I, I walked away. I walked away from that little boy and I, I haven't seen him since he was three years old and he's now 23. And, um, and I walked away and then I hit the streets and I hit the streets really hard, really hard. And, um, and I lived on the streets for many, many, many years. Um, there were times where my dad didn't hear from me for, for years. He would get, uh, calls from the police. Every police officer downtown Seattle knew who I was. And, um, and I don't know how they got his number, but they would call him and they would say, we had sightings of Rebecca and we're just letting you know that she's alive. And, um, and, 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 and there's a lot of those years that honestly, I don't remember, you know, it was, it was a blackout. Some of it's kind of starting to come back to me now. I would rather not remember because I'm so far removed from who that person was, but I'll tell you what I lived 
Um, I lived in shelters. I lived in alleys. I liked to frequent underneath the bridge. The viaduct was my favorite. I used to hang out in Seattle. I used to hang out. Um, uh, Second and Pike was pretty much, you know, my little stomping ground. And, uh, you know, and it was just a hell of an existence. You know, it was a hell of an existence. And I never in a million years thought that I would end up there. I never thought that I would end up there. And, and, and all the lines that I promised I would never cross, I'm crossing. I'm crossing and I'm crossing and I'm crossing. And then I'm getting used to it. And I got used to living like that. And I thought I had tried Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought I had tried Alcoholics Anonymous and that Alcoholics Anonymous was not for a person like me and that I was going to die underneath a bridge with a needle in my arm. And that's really what I thought. And I surrendered to that. I really thought that was my fate. And, um, but, you know, I'm, I, I'm standing here really, you know, because of a loving God, because of a loving God and because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because Alcoholics Anonymous works for anyone. You know, um, no matter what your outside story looks like, you don't have to have a story like mine to be an alcoholic. You don't. You never have had to go to jail. You don't have to have a DWI. None of that stuff, you know, makes you an alcoholic. It's how alcohol affects you, you know, and um, and alcohol certainly affected me um, to where, you know, I couldn't I just couldn't stop drinking um, and I couldn't stop using. And uh, so anyway, I'm living on the streets, and I'm, I'm living that insanity. I'm in and out of hospitals. I'm in and out of jails. I'm in and out of, you know, just that complete insanity that I was talking about. Um, and, uh, and I caught a couple cases. And I ended up in drug court. And through drug court, and this wasn't new to me. This was my third time in drug court. I had so many cases before. And they ended up um, putting me uh, uh, in the methadone maintenance program. And so I got on the methadone maintenance program, and I met my second son's dad through sober softball. And <laughs> again, a, a, a girl meets a, a boy on AA campus, and um, and I have my I have Michael, and Michael was born addicted to methadone, and um, and I and I put down the hard stuff for about three years, um, and then I convinced myself that because I'm on methadone, I would be able to drink like a normal person. I really believed that. And I started drinking again and, and uh, you know, and, and the insanity is coming. And now I have this little boy, he's two and a half years old and, uh, you know, and, and I'm taking him to places, you know, that a little boy shouldn't be at. And, you know, it's that insanity again. And, and basically what happened is I had a friend who flew me down to Los Angeles and, um, and the, the plan was to go to LA, get sober, and then move back up here and kind of pick up the pieces. And um, and I got down to L.A., and it was kind of the same thing. I went to a 7-Eleven to buy a pack of cigarettes, and there were the alcohol was calling my name, and I had no mental defense against that first drink, and I'm off and drinking again. And, and now I'm leaving my son um, at my at my mom's house. My mom lives down in L.A., and I'm running around the streets of Los Angeles, and I'm drinking in MacArthur Park. And, and, and the thing that's happening is that alcohol is no longer taking away that guilt and that shame and that pain. And what happened was alcohol stopped working for me. And I was kind of at that point, you know, that the book talks about where I can't imagine life with alcohol. I can't imagine life without alcohol. And, um, but I, you know, I just, I had a moment of clarity and again, I don't have enough time to get into it, but it involved my son and it involved what kind of mother I was. And I saw it. I saw what kind of mother I was and what kind of mother I'd become to this innocent little boy who didn't deserve any of this. And, um, and I crawled back into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, you know, I didn't think AA would work again. Like I, I thought I tried AA. I thought that this, you know, I thought that, uh, you know, um, you know, I thought I tried AA and I thought that, you know, uh, it wouldn't work for a person like me and that my problems were too complex. And, and, um, but you know what, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter what I thought. It didn't matter about any of that stuff. What, what was pointed out to me was, you know, um, uh, what my sponsor told me was that, you know, and we hear it a lot in AA too, right? Like it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what I feel, not that my thoughts and my feelings don't count, but what really counts is my is the action that I take. And so I, I was just willing and desperate enough to follow some simple action that, that Nick was talking about. You know, I got a sponsor and, and she got me in this deal. She threw me in the middle of this deal, you know, and um, and I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. I had caused a lot of wreckage for myself and my son. And um, I was living in a house in Inglewood, California with 27 people. And, um, and you know, and, and none of this is an exaggeration. I mean, my dad is right here. He knows he's witnessed all this. Um, but there was 27 people who lived in this house, three-bedroom house, you know, with me and my two-year-old son. And, uh, and, my, and I had no car. I had no key. I had no phone. I had nothing, right? And my sponsor didn't care. 
Like she did not care. She would not let me feel sorry for myself. She expected me to go to a meeting every single day. And like I said, I was just willing and desperate to do that, willing, willing enough to follow that simple direction. And, um, and I went to a meeting every single day. I took the bus and, and she said, if you get here, we'll get you home. I took the bus to a meeting and, um, and, and I had some ladies drive me home, you know, and, uh, she had me do things like show up early. She had me get commitments at every single meeting I went to my home group, um, which again, I got sober in Los Angeles. There was 800 people there and, um, it is a big group, right? And people were, <laughs> Judy, aw. And, um, and, and people dressed up at this meeting. They looked really nice. And I just, I didn't even own a dress, you know? And, uh, and I just feel, remember feeling extremely intimidated and, and, uh, and I wanted to hide and I just wanted to hide in the corner and my sponsor wouldn't let me. Like she made me walk around the room and meet people. And, um, and very slowly that fellowship started to grow up about me, you know? And very slowly, slowly I started feeling like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm part of this group, you know, and I started to look around and see, you know, that there was people in here that I loved and I respected. And, um, and then, uh, this is kind of backwards. Okay. And then, um, <laughs> And then, uh, you know, I had to do this thing called yard every Saturday. I don't know. Uh, we used to go to this old timer's house every Saturday morning. I brought my son again. He was two and a half years old. He was crazy. He was neurotic from, from what I was putting him through. And, uh, and he would walk around yard and he would scream. And what yard is, is it's, it's at an old timer's house down in Los Angeles. And the women would play uh, volleyball and the guys would go across the street and play, um, softball. And I hated these women, man. I hated them. I swore they were judging me, you know, cause my kid was running around screaming and sometimes they'd give me a look and I just interpreted it wrong. And you know, and I couldn't stand it. Like I was just going crazy out of my skin. But again, it didn't matter like what I felt. It just, I just kept taking the action, taking the action, taking the action, you know? And, uh, I had no idea what, what this was going to turn into. I had no idea. I just knew that I couldn't drink anymore. I could not drink anymore. And so whatever you tell me to do, even though it's driving me freaking nuts and I make absolutely no sense. I will do it. You know? And so I started doing that stuff and, uh, I'm obviously really passionate about this. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, my sponsor, God, I love her. You know, I love her. And, and the longer I stay sober and I think about what she did for me, it's just amazing. Um, I mentioned that I was on methadone. And I, I, I was coming to these meetings, you know, and I was claiming sobriety. And if you're in here and you're on methadone, man, welcome. You know, I am not here with any kind of judgment at all. Like, I love you and you're, you're, you belong here, you know. But I knew that if I wanted what you had, I was going to have to get off methadone. And so I stopped claiming time and, um, and I started getting real with it. And I started telling people, you know what, I'm on methadone. And, and I stood in that methadone line for four years at 100 milligrams every day. And, uh, and I wanted what you had, you know? And so I started detoxing from methadone and I went down a milligram every single day. And then when I got down to 40, I went into a detox facility and, uh, and I was sick, you know, I was really sick. And my sponsor picked me up, um, with a sobriety sister. She made me sit in the back cause we mix it. <laughs> We sit by time, <laughs> like time. Is, and I remember being pissed off about that. And, uh, that lady's not sober anymore either. She found out she wasn't an alcoholic, but, um, <laughs> but she made me sit in the back. And, um, and that day that she picked me up, you know, was the day that I was off of everything, like nothing from the neck up. Um, and that's my sobriety date, which is July 25th, 2011. And I love that day. I cherish that day. And, um, like, I remember when I had two days of sobriety, I, I couldn't sleep. I, I was so sick and I was just going out of my mind and, uh, screaming in the pillow and just like, just pounding. Like, when is this going to end? When is this going to end? And, uh, and, and someone had given me in the group, um, actually some sleeping medication. And, um, and I went and I, I asked my sponsor, I called my sponsor, I was like, please, can I take the sleeping medication? Please. I just want to sleep. I just want to sleep. And, uh, and she said, you can, but if you do, you're going to have to change your sobriety date. And, um, God, and those two days meant so much to me that I just, I held in there. I hung in there and, um, you know what? Little by little, I did get through it. I did get through it. My energy slowly started to come back. And, um, and I do remember that as soon as I came to a meeting, I felt better because I felt again, the love and the magic that was here, you know? And, um, and slowly things started to happen. Um, my sponsor too, we would meet on every Sunday after a meeting. We started reading the book together, you know, line by line. And, uh, and when it told us to pray, we prayed. And when it told us, you know, to write, we wrote, I wrote, you know, and, um, 
And things started happening. I started getting in touch with a big God, with a God that uh, of my own understanding, a God that, that, that was personal to me. It didn't have to be your God. I didn't have to define my God. You know, I love that about Alcoholics Anonymous, that our God is so full of love that it doesn't care what it's called. It just wants us to love, you know? And, uh, and anyway, so I found a God in these rooms. And, um, and uh, God, you know, little by little, I started feeling comfortable in my own skin. And um, I went back to school. Uh, I was in the place with 27 people, and, and, and I was actually at a panel. And after the panel, um, I was telling them about my current living situation, and a lady was there w who worked for the um, Midnight Mission, and she got me into a, a better um transitional house. So I went from a bad transitional to a better. So things were getting looking up, you know, and, uh, I went to a, a, a transitional house and, um, and this place was great. You know, I, I found a little job, um, a little part-time job. And, and, uh, my sponsor told me to make Alcoholics Anonymous my number one job and to find something to do during the day to keep me busy, you know? And, um, and that's what I did, you know, I made AA my number one job. And, um, but I had this little part-time job and then at about a year and a half of sobriety. And she told me at a year, just focus on sobriety, okay? Everything else will just kind of come, you know, fall into place. But for your first year, there's no dating. There's, no, you know, like we were very serious and I needed that, you know, that again may not be your experience, but I needed that. I needed to be immersed in AA. And, um, and so I went to back to school when I had about a year and a half of sobriety and um, I decided I wanted to become a surgical technician. And, uh, you know, and I went back to school and I actually did really well scholastically. I was a 4.0 student, which blew my mind, right? And, um, and what happened, Happened was I ended up um, I did really well scholastically, but it was time for me to do my clinicals. And I went and I did my clinicals. And, and what I do, what my job is, is I, I open up uh, the, the operating room for the doctor, and I'm the doctor's right hand man during surgery. Right? Like, there's a little bit of grandiosity in my thinking. <laughs> but um, here I am. I'm at clinicals, and um, I have a really difficult doctor. And um, and everyone was telling me this guy's really mean. He's really mean, and uh, they warned me about him, and he was mean. And <laughs> and I got in there, and sure enough, I screwed up. I did something, and he pushed me away from the patient and he had my preceptor, who's my educator, uh, finish the case. And, um, and after that, I went to the bathroom and I started crying. And those thoughts came through my head of like, you're a junkie, you're worthless. What are you thinking? The OR, are you kidding me? You know, you're in way over your, your head here. And, uh, but because I walked through those fears in Alcoholics Anonymous, because I learned how to honor my commitments in here, because I learned how to, how to, uh, walk through my fears with you, I was able to walk through my fears with this doctor, you know? And my second thought was, well, you know, you may be failure at this. You may not be cut out for this, but you're going to finish this. And you're going to finish this strong. And as a student, I was able to scrub in with this guy. I, I was able to uh, choose my own cases. And so I scrubbed in with this guy every chance I could. Every time he was turning around, I was gown and gloving him. And he knew he was difficult, you know, and yet here I was choosing his cases. And what happened is I earned that man's respect and he started teaching me. And people were blown away by it, too. They, he started teaching me, and he actually wrote me a letter of recommendation when I finished. And on the letter of recommendation, it said that I was the only student that he had done that for. You know, and that's, like, what AA does. You know, when I had, um, when I was at the Midnight Mission, I was asked to um, run this little, I don't know, 5K, you know, and I had never been a runner before in my life. I think I ran from the cops a couple times. Uh, <laughs> like, I had never been a runner, you know, and I was like, ah, that's, you know, whatever. And, uh, but I wanted to support the Midnight Mission, and, um, and so I, I started training on my little treadmill, and I was like, woohoo, a mile, yay, you know, and I was really excited about it, and I decided to run. Uh, I, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to help out with the minute mission. I ran the 5K. I finished the 5K, and my first thought was, oh, I want to run a marathon. And uh, it's, again, that grandiosity. You know, I always want more. And, uh, and I did. I started, I started training for this marathon, and, um, and I ran the L.A. Marathon, you know. And, uh, and I literally felt like I was being carried by angels. Like, I could not believe that, that God had placed me there, you know. And, uh, and, and the first thing I did was I called my dad when I finished and, and said that I had finished the marathon. And, um, and, then I, and then I decided I wanted to run the Seattle Marathon, and I came back, and I ran the Seattle Marathon, and, um, and I remember running, you know, on, on streets. <laughs> I ran on streets where I saw people die. I ran on streets where horrific things happened. And here I was on this marathon, running this marathon. I couldn't believe it. I passed by the jail. I stopped. I waved. <laughs> <laughs> Here I was. It's unbelievable. 
my dad was there too. I was still living in LA at the time and um, he was there and, and, and a friend, another friend in the program, Dick Billings was there and my son was there and my son's dad was there and my little brother was there who was still working on a story and smelling like it. And um, he's now four years sober, but, um, but they were there and they met me at mile five. And I remember thinking, oh my God, this is so cool. And it was cold. It was one of those cold days. It was 27 degrees, you know, and I was fine because I was moving. Um, but they were hanging out, you know, and, uh, and I saw them at mile five and I thought, okay, cool. You know, they, they came out and they supported me. That's awesome. And, and then I saw them, <laughs> I saw them at mile nine. I'm like, okay. And then <laughs> I saw them at mile 18. I'm like, wow. And then I saw them at the finish line and they waited the whole time, you know, and, uh, just to watch me finish and, and to follow me through this race. And it was just amazing. It was so amazing. And, um, I ran Seattle again. So I ran Seattle twice. And then I had an opportunity to run a marathon in Rome, Italy. And, uh, I ran a marathon in Rome, Italy, and I also ran one in Barcelona um, in October. I'm running one in Ecuador. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's not about running marathons. It's not about traveling the world, although I have. I've been to several places more than what I've just mentioned. A girl like me who couldn't get off of Second and Pike. But it's about when we do this work. When we do this work, that's where God shows up, and that's when miracles happen. My story is not unique. There are countless miracles, countless stories of just God shot after God shot after God shot in these rooms. You know, um, last thing, uh, my dad, you know, <laughs> I'm so proud of my dad. <laughs> He's my best friend today. There were years that I stole from him because of my drinking. I didn't even bat an eye. Didn't even face me. My dad visiting his little girl, his only little girl in jail, hospitals. Didn't even face me. When I had one year of sobriety, we do this really cool thing in L.A., it's an awesome tradition. It's called a watch. We go down to Norm's and it, on their 364th day at 10 p.m. and we watch them turn one. I asked my dad to come down. He was hesitant. He had seen me turn one, I don't know how many times, several, right? But he decided to come down. There was 100, about 150 people at Norm's, you know, watching me turn one. Debbie, my stepmom, who also has 40 years sober, was there on speakerphone and, and it was neat, you know? My dad was asked to speak at one of the meetings down there, and uh, he gave an excellent AA talk. And then I took my cake at one year, at my exact one-year date, just kind of felt like that at my Wednesday night meeting, and they asked me to do a 10-minute speak. And, and something healed with my dad and I. Something healed with my dad and I. And uh, every time I speak, my dad's, my dad's right here in the front row. And we get to share this deal together. We get to walk Alcoholics Anonymous together. He doesn't tell me how to work my program. He's just a dad. He's just a dad. And because of you, you've given me the opportunity to be a daughter. And that beautiful little boy who was born into this world addicted, you know, is now 10 years old. And, uh, you know, we struggle. It's hard, man. I'm a single mom, and it is hard. You know, but you guys surround us, and he's not alone. He's not alone. There's so much love in here. And if you're new, I know it seems like it's too much. Like it was for me. Like I just would hear people talk about this and it was just too much for me to fathom. But we're all saying the same thing. We're all saying the same thing. And there's just way too much evidence here. There's way too much evidence. So anyway, I got a minute 49, but I think I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> My name is Maxine, and I'm an alcoholic. I felt like Willy Wonka. I wish I could have just, like, done some flips. Uh, <laughs> um, so my home group is a uh, North Seattle group, which includes 50-50 in this meeting. Um, I stopped making cakes, so I guess they decided to throw me up here. Um <laughs> And I am walking with a cane today. I'm just going to go ahead and just get it out there so you guys will stop asking. I fell off a tree in Hawaii, um, which shows that I still make bad mistakes in sobriety. Um, so, yeah, my sobriety date is 
September 21st, uh, 2017, a little over a year. And so what it was like, uh, I came from a family of, uh, that have addicts on one side and mental illness on the other side. Um, we didn't start with a very lavish upgrowing on my mom. Uh, and my dad were in a punk rock band when I was born. So, um, we, we just didn't live a, a, a really solid foundation. Um, we were started out with, uh, pretty much nothing. And, uh, my mom just worked her ass off to, uh, slowly get us into an apartment and then into a townhouse. And then, you know, she went back to college and, um, we finally got into like a house. So I was very grateful for everything that she did. Um, I think that growing up, I always had uh, this like identity problem. Uh, my mom's side of the family was white and my dad's side was black. So I never really knew like where I fit in. I don't really look black. So it was always kind of a struggle. Um, I didn't feel comfortable in my body at all. Um, I did gymnastics uh, my whole life, and that was the only place that I did feel comfortable was, um, you know, performing in front of other people, being the center of attention, but not having to um, actually interact with anybody. Um, and that's how I kind of felt for a long time. Um, you know, I sat by myself at the lunch table. Um, I didn't really have any friends. I thought I was too cool for them because my mom was a punk rocker and, and we were just cooler than everybody. Um, and, um, my father passed away when I was in middle school. He was addicted to crack. Um, and I didn't really process that. I didn't, you know, I never knew him. He wasn't my father. Um, we, you know, my parents got divorced at a young age, and um, we stopped getting to see him after, like, my mom picking us up from some crack houses. Um, so I didn't really process that. Uh, I graduated um, from high school thinking that I was going to do gymnastics in college, um, but I had taken some art classes and decided that I was going to be an artist, a starving artist, just like my mom. And um, I got a scholarship to the Art Institute. Um, so I went and um, I think I started drinking like my last year of high school. I remember it was like New Year's Eve and I was with my boyfriend's um, family. They're Irish. So I had a Guinness and a glass of champagne. And it was it was really awesome. I felt like I, I could actually talk to people. And, um, you know, later in the evening, my mom, my boyfriend's mom was holding my hair as I threw up. Um, but I didn't really like have that instant connection to it. Yeah, it felt great. Um, but I didn't really like, let's go out and do this again. Um, it was just a subtle thing. Um, but so I, I started at the Art Institute and everything was going good. I was smoking pot and, you know, showing up pretty much drunk to most of my classes, um, but it was the Art Institute and I was drawing really good. Um, so I think I, I, a couple months into it, I think six months into it, I got diagnosed with cancer. And um, that was an out of body experience. Like I don't really remember, you know, what went on in that year of chemotherapy and radiation, but um. The, the doctor said I got PTSD from the diagnosis. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on, but I did start, um, drinking. That was when it started. Um, you know, my friends were in the city. So, um, and that's where I always wanted to be. I wanted to be in the city. I did not want to be in the suburbs. Um, so I get chemo on Fridays and then I'd be dead for a couple of days. And then, um, around like Wednesday or Thursday, I'd have energy. So I'd go into the city and I'd have a couple of beers and I would just feel like a normal, like 19 year old, how I thought a normal 19 year old should feel, you know, out partying. Um, but 
I, I wouldn't recommend it drinking while you're on chemo. Um, I was, <laughs> you know, I would have a couple of beers and I'd be just like walking down the street, like projectile vomiting and like ready to go to the next bar. Um, my friends usually had to end up calling my mom and, you know, Maxine needs to come home. Um, so that, that was, that's when I probably should have been like, oh, this is a problem, but I didn't see it. I just saw it as, you know, I'm going through a hard time and this is how I'm going through it. Um, so once I got done with that, um, I think, you know, I did not go back to school. I got into the service uh, industry pretty fast. Um, and it was just this like cycle. Um, I, you know, I was drinking to uh, not feel anything. I was drinking to feel something. Um, I didn't feel comfortable in my skin. I didn't know this body that I was in anymore. I felt like it had failed me. Um, I was a great kid growing up. Why me? Um, so I was living in this self-pity. And um, so it was a cycle. You know, I, I was very depressed. Um, I, I reached out to drugs. I, I, had a, I loved cocaine because it would just, like, allow me to, you know, continue drinking and just to, and just to feel like I could dance all night and nobody else in the world mattered. Um, and so I was doing that. And then, you know, that wasn't enough. So, um, I, I went, I started, um, you know, uh, uh, eating disorder came into play. Um, I was cutting myself on the regular, um, and, and probably once a year I was ending up in, um, a psych ward. Um, yeah, for, I didn't want, want to be alive. I did not want to be alive. And now that, that was going on for a long time. Um, I'd say like nine years of that. I was in the hospital every um, the holiday season. Um, so that was going on. And so, you know, one of the times, one of the recent times that I was trying to like get it together, I had a therapist tell me that, um, you know, I, I have chemo brain and that everything that I'm experiencing is because I basically got brain damage from all of the chemo. So, you know, this depression and any underlying disorder like alcoholism, like that, that could have blossomed. So I went to AA under this assumption that, you know, I have brain damage and I obviously cannot drink or or do anything like that because I, I just need help managing. Um, so I'll stop drinking. That um, was not a surrender for me. I, I sat in these rooms. I got a sponsor. I barely did the steps. Um, and I slowly but surely started to see all the differences that I had between you and me. Nobody was ever talking about, you know, mental health. Um, I had other problems and, and they weren't the same as your problems. Um, and so I just started to feel really lonely in these rooms. And, um, I was bartending at the time sober and, you know, I had like, uh, I had this day shift where this, uh, the, the, the reps would come in and they'd all come in with their like tastings and I'd be like, Oh yeah, that smells great. That smells great. Um, and eventually I was like, Oh, let me taste that. I'll just have a taste. And it, it was fine. I spit it back out. It was fine. Um, <laughs> and then, and then eventually it was like, Oh, I'm, I'm drinking this taste. Can I have another taste? That was really good. Um, and then I, I started, you know, going on dates with these guys from the bar. Just, I'm sober, but yeah, I met you last night and you were wasted. And I think this is a good idea. And eventually that led to me being on, you know, a rooftop drinking a, a, a rosé slushy. I'm like, this is, this is great. I'm just gonna have a rosé slushy and I'm going to continue on with my life because I'm not an alcoholic. Um, but that, that wasn't true. I slowly, um, not slowly, I rapidly went out 
I really went out and for the first time I saw like how bad it was. I, any like standards that I have just flew out the window. I was doing whatever I could with anybody that I could. I was broke. I was staying with people that I shouldn't have been staying with. Um, I had nowhere to go. And, um, so I, I tried to kill myself again and it didn't go well. And, um, I got out of the hospital and uh, the plan was for me to come to Seattle. And my mom was like, I'm not going to pay for you to come up here. You're going to have to figure it out. And I couldn't figure it out. And I called my mom and I was like, I told you that I was sober right now, but I'm not. I don't know how to stop. I can't figure this out. I don't know how to do this. And I and I surrendered right there. Um, I just didn't know what to do. She told me to get on the next flight, and I did. And and from here, like, I don't know what happened. I just, my feet were walking, but I wasn't doing it. Um, I think it was a, a, what you would call a God shot. Um, I landed here the whole way on the flight. I thought about how I was going to get off and just, you know, not meet my mom and just go find some drugs or some alcohol and just, you know, just wander off into the oblivion. But I got off the plane and and I and I went and um, and she introduced me to some of her Pokemon Go friends that were sober and um <laughs> And um, they took me to a meeting. They took me to 50-50. And um, everybody just opened me, like, welcomed me with open arms. And I felt it for the first time. That glow that everybody was talking about, I saw it. And um, I just, I wanted it. And I wanted all of this, like, all of this, like, darkness that I was feeling inside. I just wanted it out of me. I wanted it out of me because I'm obviously not good at trying to kill myself. And if I'm going to live, that I, I need to live a happy life. And, um, and I won't settle for anything less. So I got a sponsor. And um, we dove into the steps. Um, and, and, and I just needed the steps. I needed them now and I needed them fast. Like I, I, I wouldn't say it was easy for me to do the steps, but it was easy for me to want to do them um, because I couldn't sit in my body any longer. Um, and every time we did a step, it was like I was reaching down inside of me and just pulling out, you know, whatever grime was in there, you know, one step at a time. And, um, and I, every time I just felt a little bit of relief. Um, and, and with that relief, I've made it to, um, a year, over a year. And, and that's really exciting. I get to do things, um, like have my first sponsee and, you know, have my first sponsee not call me anymore. And, and, and I guess that's just how it goes. Um, we'll see about the next one. <laughs> um, and I also get to do things like I'm, I'm going to be starting a CNA class in the, in February and I'm going to go back to school in um, summer and I'm, and I'm trying to be a nurse, you know, I've been on the other side of the nurse for so long. Um, and I'm so excited to, to be on that side and just to give back. Um, and with that, I'll also say that I have a service position and, and that helps me so much. And right now that service position is um, service chair and we're having a business meeting tonight and we need some um, spots to be filled. So if you'd like to stay, we'd love to have you. And I think my time is up. So thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.